Well, as I was preparing in the last couple of weeks, one day I was um, on the internet looking for stuff about Jesus, and I came across, interestingly enough, um, a list of the top 100 movies uh, all, of all time. Top 100 movies of all time. So naturally, you know, you see something like that, you can't help it. I took a look to see how many I'd seen and to see if I agreed with the list. What do you, and there's lots of lists out there, by the way. What do you think was the number one movie on the top 100 movies of all time? What was listed number one? Anybody? Wizard of Oz. On this particular list, it was the Wizard of Oz. And then I kept reading down. The next one I had seen and recognized was number nine, E.T. Who knows when that movie was made, E.T.? 1982. Yikes. It made me feel old. Number 33 was Selma, a movie my wife and I saw just this summer, made about the events that happened in my lifetime. I thought it was a pretty good movie. I scanned the whole rest of the list and was disappointed, eventually, as you would be if you scanned such a list, not to find some of my personal favorites. For example, Braveheart, not there. One of the great guy movies of all time. And No Princess Bride? Inconceivable. Right? <laughs> Thank you. No Outlaw Josie Wales? I mean, really. Disqualified the whole list. But I did find all three Toy Story, Story movies in the top 100. All three of them listed in the top 100. Now, the Toy Story movies were made by a company called Pixar. Pixar also made animated hits like Finding Nebo, Monsters, Inc., The Incredibles, Up, and just recently Inside Out. And the CEO of Pixar is a man named Ed Catmull, and if you attended our hosting of the Willow Creek uh, Global Leadership Summit right here at the West Campus a couple weeks ago, Ed Catmull was one of the speakers. Well, he was interviewed by Pastor Bill Hybels. And at the end of his interview, he said this sentence. He said, I do what I do because I believe stories can change the world. He said, I believe stories can change the world. Now, Ed Catmull is not a Christian, but I think he's right. But maybe not in the way he's thinking exactly. Stories are powerful, but there is only one story that changed the world and still changes the world, and that's the story we begin looking at this evening, the story of Jesus. Jeff and I are going to spend the next year, along with Sterling and others who preach to you, teach you, uh, the next 52 weeks, preaching through the Gospels and the story of Jesus. Because the story of Jesus is the story that changes the world. It's the story that changes your story and my story. In John 20, the Apostle John tells us why he wrote his gospel. Here's what he says. John 20, verse 30, 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's why John wrote, that's why we're preaching through the story of Jesus, that by hearing you may believe, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now today we begin the story of Jesus in a three-week mini-series called Anticipation, Prophecies of the Messiah. Now the word anticipation means expectation. It means hope. It's a word that carries the sense of something good that's just around the corner. And we anticipate, <coughs> excuse me, all kinds of good things in our lives. We can anticipate a long-awaited vacation, for example. We can anticipate a graduation or a wedding. You can see them coming. You can plan. You can anticipate. We can anticipate the start of the football season. High school football starts next Friday night. Can hardly wait. Perhaps nothing in human life is anticipated as much as the birth of a child. My wife and I visited my parents, my family who live in Ohio, uh, this past week on the occasion of my parents' 60th wedding anniversary. And my nephew, Jeremy, my brother's son, and his wife, Kelly, are expecting their first child in September. And they are just bursting with anticipation. And seeing them reminded us of our own, of that time in our own lives when we anticipated a child arriving into our world. Now, when we think of the story of Jesus, we most often tend to think of the New Testament, the Gospels. 
because that's where we see the stories about Jesus' life and ministry. And that's where we're going to spend most of the next year. But that's not where we're going to start. We're going to back up a bit. We're going to back up uh, into the Old Testament because the whole Old Testament, properly understood, is about anticipation. It's about anticipation. The Old Testament is like the prequel to the story of Jesus. And it comes to us through these ancient and mysterious books called the prophets. With names like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Zephaniah. Uh, books written centuries before Jesus was born. Now, we may not often dive into these books. We may not often flip through our Bibles and read them. But they're incredibly important. And they became even more important back in 1947 when some Bedouin shepherds in Israel were looking for their sheep in a desolate region near the Dead Sea. And they stumbled across a bunch of ancient clay pots in a series of caves. And it turned out that these ancient pots uh, contained scrolls. And these scrolls contained manuscripts or fragments of manuscripts from almost every Old Testament book. And they were dated a thousand years earlier than any previous manuscript discovered by scholars. Now, when scholars uh, opened these ancient manuscripts, uh, they expected to find all kinds of discrepancies. They expected that, like a game of telephone, that the scriptures had been written and rewritten and rewritten and changed so they wouldn't be unrecognizable if you went back a whole thousand years, a millennium. That's not what they found. They found these writings were almost exactly word for word what, was, what they had in their Bibles in 1947 and what you have in your Bibles here today. Don't let anyone ever tell you that you can't trust the Bible, that it's been corrupted and changed over time. It's not been. The Bible is one of the most historically verifiable documents in world history. Don't let anybody tell you differently. So as we begin anticipation, uh, we begin in Jeremiah, one of the prophets, chapter 23. Let me read these verses to you. You can look in your Bibles or on the screens. Jeremiah 23. Behold, says the prophet, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a, a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. That's all we're going to read tonight from Jeremiah. But I want you to see that Jeremiah is saying, first of all, that the coming king is the source of our righteousness. Is the source of righteousness. Now, most of you know that my wife and I, uh, Lorene and I, have four sons. And our oldest, uh, whose name is Jordan, is significantly taller than either one of us, my wife or myself. Although I tell my boys I used to be much taller when I was younger, before, you know, time and gravity took over. Um, I don't think they believe me, but my son is 6'5", and sometimes people ask, well, where did his height come from? Where did his height come from? Well, my wife's father is Malaysian by heritage, uh, Sri Lankan actually, he's about 5'4". My dad is about 5'9", so it didn't come from either one of them. Uh, take a look at this photo. Uh, this was taken in late 1939, it's one of the only photographs that exists from my father's childhood. Uh, he's the little guy, front right. He's just a little over five years old. His sister's arms are around his shoulders there. The rest of his five siblings are in the picture, as well as his mother, who was a widow by this time, and then his grandparents. Now, check out the tall guy in the back row, the guy with the dark eyes and the drooping mustache. That's my grandfather, my fa that's my great-grandfather, my father's grandfather, his name was Wyatt Earp. No, I'm just kidding. His name was, <laughs> name was Will Coffey. Now, he's about six foot five, an extraordinarily tall man for his generation, and I think he just might be the source of my son's height several generations later. Now, in this passage, the prophet is tracing the source, not of a person's height, but the source of of our righteousness. He says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. Now, that's strange language for us. What's he talking about? A bit of historical background here. Jeremiah is often called the weeping prophet. And he's called that because God called Jeremiah to do a very hard job. 
I wonder, has God ever called you to a hard thing? Ever asked you to do something very difficult? Well, Jeremiah had to deliver a lot of bad news to some very important people, and he was abused and persecuted for doing so. He lived in the 7th century B.C. He prophesied during the reigns of the last five kings of Judah, which was the southern kingdom of Israel, most of them very corrupt, evil men. Uh, God called Jeremiah to point out the sins of the people of Judah and the sins, in particular, of the kings. Now, no one likes to have their sins called out, especially very powerful people. And so Jeremiah was not a popular figure. He's the one that had to come to the kings and say, because of your sin, O king, because you have led the people to follow false gods, <coughs> excuse me, because you have sacrificed the children of your people to those foreign gods, you are going to be judged. And that judgment will come in the form of invaders from the north, in particular King, Babylon, or king Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, and they will destroy your city and carry your people away into captivity. Jeremiah was not very well liked because he obeyed the Lord God. Wasn't invited to any king's dinner parties. Well, that judgment eventually came to pass in 586 B.C. You can read about this in secular history books. Nebuchadnezzar and the armies of Babylon sacked Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, just as Jeremiah had predicted by the word of the Lord. But notice, even though the southern kingdom of Judah would be destroyed, God continued to promise that restoration was coming. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. What's God talking about here? Let's start with David. Most of us here remember and recognize the name David. We know David uh, uh, killed some guy named Goliath in battle. We know David was pretty important in the Bible. Might even know he was responsible for a lot of the Psalms you have in your Bible. Uh, but David is a towering figure in the history of Israel and in Scripture. He was the second king of Israel, became king in about 1,000 B.C., so roughly 3,000 years ago, following King Saul. He was catapulted into popularity after defeating Goliath in a battle as a young man. He is called in Scripture a man after God's own heart, the greatest king of Israel who ruled over, ruled over a time of great prosperity for God's people, even though David struggled mightily with some personal sins. But God chose and anointed David, and when he chose David as king, he promised in 2 Samuel 7, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Your throne will be established forever. Now scholars believe this promise of a kingdom that would endure forever is a reference to the Messiah, the one for whom Israel waited, the one who would come from David's line that would bring salvation and deliverance for God's people. But soon after David's death, the nation began to deteriorate. The leadership began to deteriorate, leading to a long line of corrupt and evil kings, culminating in God's judgment being unleashed in the form of Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon, and the nation was destroyed. So what about the promise? What about the enduring forever thing? Now, let's go back and look at the meaning of this phrase, righteous branch. The first word, righteous, is the Hebrew word sedak, which means to be upright, to walk straight, to keep on the path, to live rightly before God. Now, God is absolutely righteous. This word comes from God's character. God is holy, and his people are called to be righteous as well. But the concept of God's righteousness leaves us with a bit of a problem. We see that problem throughout Scripture. Because even though we can do righteous things, we can manage to stay mostly on the path of God's righteousness most of the time, like obeying the Ten Commandments, we cannot do so perfectly. None of us can. We have a righteousness problem that we cannot fix on our own. The New Testament, jumping ahead for a moment, explains how God chose to solve this problem. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We cannot be righteous by our own efforts, but we can be made righteous. So God is telling Jeremiah, that the prophet, uh, Jeremiah the prophet, that one is coming who is righteous in himself and who will be able to restore his people to righteousness 
to restore them to right relationship with God. Let's talk about this word, this word branch. The Hebrew word translated branch means shoot or bud. It refers to the source of life for a tree. If that tree's cut down, the branch or the shoot or the root will grow again, a new tree. And on a number of occasions, this word in the Old Testament is used to refer to the coming Messiah. We sang about it earlier tonight. Uh, Isaiah 11, verse 1 says, There shall come forth a shoot, same word, from the stump of Jesse, and a, that's David's father, uh, a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. The prophet's saying that even though Israel's kings have been, have been corrupt, even though they've turned away, even though God's judgment has come, and in a sense the tree of Israel and Judah has been cut down, God's promise to David is still intact. One who is coming, who will come from the same root, the same shoot as the great King David, who not only will be righteous in himself, but can make righteous those who, who turn to him because he is the source of all righteousness. Secondly, we see here in the prophet the reign of righteousness. We saw the source, now we see the reign of righteousness. Now as people who live in the 21st century North America, we can scarcely imagine uh, the power and wealth of ancient kings. The, fr the, the whole notion of a king is relatively foreign to us. Uh, Jeff and I and our wives visited Israel last spring where the inspiration of the series came from. And we were there, we saw all kinds of uh, ancient ruins. It's a really, really old part of the world. Uh, the photo behind me here is uh, taken at a place called Tel Dan, which is near the headwaters of the Jordan River in the north part of Israel. The wall behind us there dates to the kingdom of Ahab in the 9th century B.C., right around the time of David, so about 3,000 years ago. Uh, there are stories in the Old Testament that actually take place right near around the vicinity of this wall. But this wall, we found out, is built on top of the ruins of a Canaanite city, which dates back to the 18th century B.C., almost 4,000 years ago. And that city was built on an even earlier civilization that reaches back to nearly 3,000 B.C., or 5,000 years ago. And you can see parts of those walls at this particular archaeological site. Now think about that for a moment. What parts of your own homes will still be intact 5,000 years from now? Take a guess. Maybe the Twinkies in your pantry, they last, last like forever. Okay? Jeff and I are standing on a little platform in front of the wall, and at that time it was just outside of some massive city gates that are no longer there. And on this raised platform would have been an ornate seat or throne that would have been reserved for the king of that ancient city. And throughout the Old Testament we see verses like this from 2 Kings. Then the king arose and sat in the gate. <coughs> now, it makes no sense for us to sit in the gate, but to them it did, because they sat right outside the city gates, and only the king sat there, because it was his city, and they were his people, and that was his wall, and that was his chair, like me sitting on my porch in the late afternoon, looking at my yard, my house, this is my place. Well, everything belonged to the king in those days. That's what kings did. Now, we saw incredible feats of construction and engineering in the ancient world, Walls constructed with enormous stones and put together without concrete or mortar of any kind. And after 5,000 years, these walls are still standing. It's just extraordinary. And almost all of these projects were envisioned and ordered by an ancient king and accomplished by three means. Unlimited wealth, unlimited slave labor, and unlimited power. They could accomplish amazing things. A king in the ancient world had absolute power. Literally, the power of life and death over everyone who ruled within his reach. And in this context of kingship, Jeremiah writes, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. Now, Jeremiah has already spoken words of judgment against the corrupt kings of Israel. But now he's talking about a different kind of king. A king who will be the righteous branch of David, who will come from David's line, but will not fall into corruption and sin. Rather, a king who can make righteousness happen. 
a king who will deal wisely, a king who will execute justice and righteousness in the land. In sharp contrast with all the kings who've gone before, kings who tolerated the worship of pagan idols, kings who encouraged people to offer their own children as burnt sacrifices. That was happening in that day. God's promise that a new and greater king is coming who will reign with wisdom and justice. Now, Jeremiah is writing about 600 years before the birth of Jesus. But listen to how the New Testament describes Jesus himself. In 1 Corinthians 1.30, Paul writes, It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us the wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Hear the language? Jesus has become wisdom from God. Our righteousness. Again, Romans chapter 3. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Remember that righteousness problem I talked about a bit ago? We cannot become righteous on our own, but there is one who can make righteous. We see that both wisdom and righteousness are identified as a person. Paul identifies that person as Jesus, the fulfillment of prophecies given by Jeremiah centuries before. Jesus is the one who deals wisely and executes justice. Jesus is the one who brings the wisdom of God, who accomplishes our righteousness, restores us to right relationship with God. Tomorrow, as you saw in the uh, video announcements, is our picnic and food pack and baptism. I saw some of you bringing in your food bags tonight. Thank you so much for doing that. That's why I'm wearing my Cool Shepherd's Heart Ministries uh, blue shirt to remind people of our food pack. It's all going in the truck out there. We're going to feed our neighbors, and then we're going to feed ourselves at our picnic. Picnic starts about 1 o'clock, and at 2.30, we're going to baptize. We always do this at our picnic. We have about 12 or 13 who have committed to baptism tomorrow. I've read some of their faith stories. And you do not want to miss baptism. Because you can hear stories of real people who could not solve the righteousness problem on their own, but met the one who can make righteous. Hope you're there tomorrow at 2.30, right outside this building for our picnic and baptism. So we have the source of righteousness. We have the reign of righteousness Third thing we see is the Lord, our righteousness. In Jeremiah's time, if you try to put yourself back into that day, and it's really difficult to do so, it had to look to the people of Judah like the whole world was coming apart at the seams. I mean, think about it. Their kings are chasing after pagan idols. Their children are being sacrificed to those idols. The armies of Babylon have broken down the walls of their city and are threatening to burn it to the ground. And if you think about it, it's not all that different from what we see all around us today. Maybe a little different key. Our cultures are different. But think about it. World leaders who ignore the truth and counsel of God Almighty. Children sacrificed to the God of convenience through abortion. Children sacrificed to the God of pleasure through the sex trade. Terrorists around the world threatening all of Western civilization. Righteousness nowhere to be found. Their God seemed far, far away. And yet Jeremiah writes, In his days Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. That phrase, the Lord is our righteousness, is actually the translation of two Hebrew words. Jehovah Sidkenu. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but that's what it looks like. Jehovah Sidkenu, and it's a name. It's not a phrase, it's a name. It's one of the many beautiful and descriptive names given to God throughout the Old Testament. You know, Old Testament people, people of Israel, didn't just use one word for God. We call God God, sort of a generic word, God. But to the Hebrew people, God had many names <coughs> that described his nature, beautiful names in their language, like El Shaddai, the Lord God Almighty, El Elyon, Most High God, Adonai, the Lord, Jehovah Yahweh, I am that I am, Jehovah Ra'a, the Lord our shepherd, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider, and many, many others. And then there's this one, this name, 
Jehovah Sidkenu, only used twice in the entire Old Testament. It means the Lord is our righteousness. Now, what's the significance of this name? Why does God give this name to Jeremiah to give to us in Jeremiah 23? Well, just as the people of Jeremiah's time saw their nation and the world falling apart, we look around us today and it's hard not to see that something's wrong. It's hard not to see something's wrong. Things are not as they should be. Read today's paper. Read tomorrow morning's paper. Racial unrest, religious violence, domestic abuse, economic fears. The world is not a righteous place, is it? It's not. And then we look at ourselves, if we're honest. We look deep into our own hearts, and we know things are not as they should be. Pride and anger and selfishness and greed all dwell and swirl within our hearts. We are not righteous people, not in and of ourselves. And we cannot make ourselves righteous. We need someone who has the power and the authority and the desire to make the unrighteous righteous. Most great stories, almost every great movie that we come to love has something in common. They have things in common. They have a main character, a protagonist, an antagonist. Uh, there's a problem or crisis that develops that needs to be resolved. And the crisis creates a sense of tension and anxiety. We end up thinking, you know, will the, will the main character survive? Uh, will, will, what will happen in the end? Will, will the hero come in time? Will things be resolved? And quite often, if it's a good novel writer or it's a, a good movie maker, will be given hints or sort of little portents about what might happen, about what must happen. If the movie is Batman, they'll shoot that light up into the sky, you know, that has the bat figure on it. And we'll wait. We'll wait in anticipation. Will he arrive in time? Will he come in time? We begin to anticipate. How's the story going to end? How's the story going to turn? We read these verses from this ancient prophet, and we see that 2,600 years ago, God enabled a man named Jeremiah to look out at the world and see that the world is not as it should be. Through the words of the prophet, God gives us today a hint as how the great story will one day end. And that hint is a name, Jehovah Sidkenu. The Lord is our righteousness. And this name that carries this promise echoes down through the centuries from scrolls pulled from broken ancient pots in a cave to the words of those scrolls being repeated and repeated and copied again and again through books and sermons and books and sermons from generation to generation, culture to culture, until they cascade down into this room today. Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord, our righteousness. That name says the broken story of the world can be restored, will one day be restored. That name says the broken story of your own life can be rewritten and is being rewritten. That name says your story has not yet been finished. That no matter what brokenness, no matter what pain, no matter what fear, no matter what sin marks the pages of your story, there is one called Jehovah Sidkenu, who is your righteousness, who can make you righteous. And this is is the beginning of his story. I hope you'll read with us and stay with us through this series as we pick it up again next week. Let's bow in prayer as I close. Lord God, I thank you today for your word. I thank you for the great story we find in your word. Help us to understand your story, the beginnings of it, the root of it, how it began, why you've done what you've done, how we're to relate to your story. Teach us how your story intersects with each one of our stories. To erase 
to rewrite, to transform our stories into stories of beauty and grace and joy. We pray these things in the name of Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness.